increasing the impact of oral history with human language technology. That's more or less the container title of this talk. Um, first, maybe starting with the nice cartoon from Jakob. Um, you know all the original title and I was thinking what's my position in this? Well, I'm a computer scientist. That means <laughs> it's not my computer. Huh? Okay. No. Um, so I can't explain about people, but I can explain about access, words, searching, technology and things like that. And um, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot in all the discussion in Clarin in the Netherlands, that's called Claria, but it is Clarin, is that computer scientists say, well, sorry, but I'm not a plumber. And that's an important issue. Because we see that in the collaboration between, well, uh, linguist, humanities scholars in general, and on the other side, the ICT people, um, the interests are different. Um, an oral historian is interested in all that technology for his or her work. A computer scientist is interested to show that his method is improving the speech recognition quality by 0.0% and uh, using that for a paper and then goes on to the next topic. So what we see in the Clarin and Claria community that it is often very difficult to have the new technology developed by ICT people on a sustainable basis working for the humanities scholars. And that is a really, really big problem because then after Christmas, and that's a real story on the University of Amsterdam, uh, the scholars from the University of Utrecht and the collaboration program couldn't access the, um, all the methods and all the methodology. Why? Oh yes, we had an update uh, uh, in the Christmas holiday. Because now it's faster, it's working better, etc. But and, I mean, and that's a huge problem. So what we do need, and I guess that Dieter will know that as well, and Sebastian, we need some plumbers, who people who are ICT skilled, but are willing to help the humanities scholars with all the new technology. And um, okay, so that is my role in Claria, and then also I'm working a little bit as a scientist on the University of Trent on the, uh, the field of language and uh, speech technology. Um, this was a particular slide I added it this morning, uh, especially for John. But I absolutely agree that in order to improve the use of technology inside the humanity community, co um, humanity scholars, not only the students but also the the, 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 the the seniors, need to know a little bit about coding, about using computer scripts, the Unix shells, the Pythons, etc., etc., in order to work with the data. Now it is often a separate world and they do speak a different language. That means that if you start a project with two groups working together, they don't understand each other. Sometimes they use the same words and then after a couple of months, it turns out that the meaning for an ICT a scholar is absolutely something else than the same word for a humanities scholar. So pay attention on this difference in, in interest in working. So this kind of course, and we did it, and it was quite successful um, at the Utrecht University. We will repeat it for other faculties and other universities this year and the coming years. But it's very good to have this kind of coding uh, initiatives between humanities scholars and ICT uh, people. Okay. And then about our history collection. So one of the questions, and it's a question I discuss often with, with Steph, is the invisibility, invisibility of the oral history uh, collections. Why are so many oral history collections virtually invisible um, or not usable? Sometimes you know that they are there and then they are not, or yet to a small amount, usable. I was thinking about some, some reasons. It's often the lack of metadata, and then especially uh, correct and usable uh, metadata. Non-open policy of the archives. Sometimes it's uh, uh, forbidden, sometimes they are not willing, sometimes they have a different interest. That's often blocking the use of the oral history collection for other scholars. You have IPR rules, and in the previous discussion we had a very nice example about the difference about the museum law and the archive law in Denmark, 
sometimes a collection is a museum collection, sometimes an archive collection, different laws, different possibility to open it, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So the IPR and there's an, an, a working group inside Clarin working on all these kind of legal issues, but it is sometimes really blocking. You want, everyone say, well, we want, but it is impossible. It is sometimes not digitalized. Well, that's often a question of money, but also how do you do it in a correct way? And I think we need more tutorials, screencast, in wherein we show to the other, well, less experienced scholars, okay, I have 20 cassettes. How do I proceed? What do I need to do in order to make it as good as possible? I mean, you can't improve the data, but at least you, uh, what do I have to do? And then, uh, <coughs> also mentioned a lot of times this morning, but I believe it is more important than, than we often think, the local language. Um, I will give you some examples of a project that we did in Bosnia, and I'm not sure how many people are speaking Bosnian, but it's not that much. So if you do it only in the Bosnian language, it's only a small group of people that can use it. Um, we translated it all in English, but it is the same for all our Dutch um, collections. Um, we need to look for more multilinguality inside the metadata and also the data. Metadata often is in English, okay, that's fine, but the data most of the time not. Um, and for me, and I'm not 100% sure if that's correct or not, but there's a lack of metadata standards. There are some standards for the different dis disciplines, but still I found it difficult to say, okay, we start a new oral history project, what are the standards, what are the metadata that we are using? How flexible are our metadata? Now we start with Dublin Core, that's, well, not that interesting, then we add something, but after half a year someone will add something additional. Is that possible? And according to the CMDI, the standard that Clarin is using, that should be possible, but as far as I know there is no agreement about a good metadata standard for oral history, but I hope I'm wrong. Um, the lack of fine-grained description, I will come to that <coughs> later. The lack of the full recordings, what we see in this internet, well, time, that a lot of the original oral history collections that we were using are now blocked, and we just see some snippets of interesting stories. So a lot of archives and, and um, organizations showing their recordings show just the interesting snippets. So you get five minutes interview from an hour. So, okay, that's nice, it's interesting, so I'm curious to see the rest. No, the rest is blocked or it's not there. So we have to take care that, okay, the snippets, the interesting parts are good <coughs> to get attention, but give the, at least the researchers always access to the full recordings. Don't cut in the full recordings. And then often um, a lack of context. <coughs> you see a nice interview but you don't know all the discussions before the people, what is the background of the people, and that's connected to the lack of good metadata. The other part is the human language technology. Um, of course automatic speech recognition in this field is the most well promising most requested uh, technology. And if we look to the two, well, legs of the automatic speech recognition, and tomorrow morning there will be an, um, a good discussion about it. But you can say, well, the real recognition, so here's the audio, tell me what is inside, and you have the alignment. And that means that you know already what was said, but you need the exact time definition. This word started at that time and ended at that time. And that's quite important. The main goal of it is, is making the audio searchable. Then we have optical character recognition. Often we, and we'll give you an example of such a project we did a couple of years ago. Um, you have a lot of paper, then you need optical character recognition to go from the text, um, as the example of this morning, as the handwritten text about it was from Louise, what girls 20 years ago wanted to be. Um, so you need that as well, and in Clarin this technology luckily is available. It is often language dependent, so I'm not sure how well it works for all the languages, but it is there. And you use the results reading the paper transcriptions, that will be in the next example. So we had the transcriptions typed somewhere in the 40s, and we needed OCR to digitize them. 
And often you see digitizing the corresponding documents to create the context, create also the language models needed for a good recognition. If you know where the topic is about, what the persons are going to tell, it helps you with the, the real speech recognition. So you need this background information. So we need it for the recognition, etc. This is the example. Um, our queen was living for five years during the war uh, nearby Oxford, well, in, in London or between Oxford and London, I believe. And um, each four weeks, I believe, she was giving a talk for Radio Orange. Um, so Radio Free Holland, you may say. And we got the paper transcription. We did the OCR and we got this kind of Dutch. Well, for the non-Dutch, that's a little bit difficult to understand. But you see the, the bold words, Den Menschheit, was a kind of Dutch from 1900. So already in 1940 it was old-fashioned, but that was the way the Queen was speaking. And that was also, well, that was what we, uh, was recorded. So the first thing we did was a modern translation into modern Dutch, or a translation to modern Dutch, with a kind of spell checking, that's also a language technology. So we went from, well, 19th century Dutch to modern Dutch. That's fine, then we did the alignment and the searchability and things like this. But then to increase the outreach of such a collection, it should be nice to create automatic transcription. And to the native English, or people who are speaking good English, I'm not 100% sure if this is correct English, but it is close and I guess you will understand more or less what she is telling at, at this part of the interview. <coughs> so for looking inside the collection to understand is this an interesting part for me, yes or no, automatic speech recognition, this is not fake. I mean, I, I really use Google Translate to, well, translate this. Um, I believe it's good enough to see if you need 100% transcription, yes or no. But this helps a lot in the outreach of your collection because, well, we have 20, people, 20 million people speaking Dutch, not that many. So if we want this collection, well, offer it, it to the world, we need some kind of translation in other languages. Um, a very short word about speech recognition. Some of you will know, some not. But it was a long time from 2000, more or less, till five years ago, that the speech recognition was more or less stable. And then in 2010, Microsoft came out with a paper about deep learning, neural net using neural networks for speech recognition. And then you see that the error rate is really 50% of what it was more or less before. So that is so such a high quality that speech recognition becomes more and more accessible to all of us, and all uh, especially usable uh, to us. So speech recognition is something to consider for the automatic transcription, but no, um, well you don't get 100% correct transcription. Errors will be there. Um, something else is the social signal processing, already mentioned by Francisca this morning. Um, that means that we look to images, to face and, and sometimes body images, what I am doing, waving my hands, what are the, um, how is my face acting on the question and things like that. And also on the prosody and the whole stuff. And I mean, this technology is available, but not so, not in the Clarion infrastructure, I believe, at least at the moment. It isn't there, it's, but well, I don't know why it should be possible. What you want to do is the social cues and meaning inside the signal, so the non-verbal cues, and it can help you with all kinds of analysis. And that may make also an oral history collection much more interesting for other scientists, social uh, scientists uh, as well, and not only historians. So what needs to be done? And I have two groups, the oral history community and the, well, Clarin infrastructure group. Facilitating useful human language technology, well, it is there, but not 100%. I guess web services for editing the metadata, web services um, for curation, and broadcasting the metadata of the oral history collection. And if we follow uh, Dieter's advice, branding a little bit oral history inside uh, Clarin, that will be done. 
And if we look to our history community, and that's, I believe, not something Clarin can do. Clarin can do the technical part, but in our history community, we need to come forward with a flexible, comprehensive metadata scheme. So I'm thinking on CMDI, but well, this obligatory and potential fields so that we have much more flexibility of creating this metadata. And that will help other scholars if, they, if we have good manuals, what do I need to do? in order to make it. And then, I believe, and that's something we did in the next project, we divided the metadata in static metadata and dynamic metadata. Static, data made, static metadata is about the interview or the, the file itself. Dynamic metadata is metadata depending on the, on the place inside the interview. And then a last consideration about this part. If you use subtitlings, don't switch, don't use SRT, but use the new HTML5 web VTT format. It's a simple format, but it gives you the possibility to divide your whole interview in chapters, in comments, in different colors for different speakers and things like that. It is a very easy standard. It is accepted more or less by most of the browsers and it gives you the possibility to give much more information to people. So you have chapters and you can click on a chapter and jump directly to the chapter that you believe is interesting for you. Um, so give it an, a look, but it will help in the outreach of your collection. Um, dynamic metadata, this is an, a very simple example that I did with one of the interviews. I collected all the with speech recognition all the words in the first three minutes, in the middle three minutes, and in the last three minutes from half an hour, I believe, calculated the different word cloud, and that in itself can give you some information. Hey, they started with this word, then those words, and then in the end, uh, that was. So that's what we consider as dynamic metadata. To sum up this, we have metadata about, of course, the collection niveau. Then we have it on the file level. We have the Dublin Core, but Dublin Core is not telling you anything about the content of the files. So it needs to be there, but uh, we need more. And then we have dynamic meta. So we can divide an interview or a recording in topics, in chapters, in speakers. We can add additional documents on the different parts of uh, the recording and then there is room for other. But this is what we see as dynamic metadata. And that can help. And why? Well, this is just on one audiovisual recording. But now we have hundreds of recordings. And we have these different topics. And what we believe will be interesting is to see, OK, I'm interested in one topic but not in one audio recording, but in a whole collection or a couple of collections. <coughs> and that's what we can do with this kind of technology. If we say, okay, all the yellow is live during the war, and here coming back home, and this was a religion during the war, or what else? So if you want to profit from all the audio that's outside, it may help if you can have this kind of division in, um, in your collections. Um, and then we get this nice graph. I'm looking for social justice. I have the word graph here and say, hey, okay, social justice, that's topic seven. Give me all the interviews around the center of topic seven. And then I get this kind of interviews. And you say, well, interview X, it is from time one to time two and also time three to time four, et cetera, et cetera. So you can get automatically snippets of audio recordings or audiovisual recordings talking about one particular topic you are looking for. Some examples. This was our Bosnian uh, project. Yeah, Bosnian project. And you see here below already the division in the different topics. Um, you see also that it was uh, recorded in Bosnian transcribed in Bosnian, not automatically because the speech recognition at the time was not good enough to do that. And then 
we have the English translation. And the translation was done by students, even of a, for the same reason, automatic transcription, translation of Bosnian six years ago was not good enough to do it automatically. But it's very nice because now you can look to the interviews, listen how she is talking about terrible uh, things, and at the same time you can read it in English below and understand what she is talking about. Another project we are currently working on, the University of the Netherlands. It's a kind of a project in combination with the broadcast companies. And each time a famous professor is talking for 15 minutes about a certain topic. And well, she's an, an expert on terrorism and she's talking about the war in Iraq and things like that. Most of you will not understand it because it is in Dutch. Okay, well, it's a nice in the interview, but yeah, as long as your Dutch is not good enough, what do you do? So the, the company or the organization who's doing this asked me, say, hey, Arjan, can we do something? Say, okay, to increase the impact, we have the collections. We use automatic speech recognition. That's what you saw in the subtitling. We get an imperfect result. The next step is to use crowdsourcing. And with crowdsourcing, we hope to have a 98, 99%, so a perfect, a perfect uh, result. Then we use automatic translation, Google or another engine, and again, an imperfect result. The next step is, again, crowdsourcing, and then we hope to get perfect English subtitles. So that's the, well, we are working on it right now. And the, the first results of the automatic speech recognition are good. 94, 95%, so it is good. But we need 4% extra, and we hope to do, to, to do that with crowdsourcing. And that will increase. There will 20 million people speaking Dutch. That's nice, but if we can do it in English, we have, well, half of the world. Um, I'm not sure if some people in Japan or Italy are interested to listen to a Dutch professor speaking in Dutch with English subtitles, but, well, that's to see. Um, and then finally, um, and that's som also something I believe Clarin should pay somewhat more attention, is the clustering software. And for the time now I will not give a demo, but I can do it later on in the pause. But there are some nice open source um, projects where you can load a URL. I did an example this morning with the Republica, an Italian newspaper. I say, well, this is the URL give me a division in the different topics uh, of that newspaper. And that works. So clustering software, and then again, if you, if you go back to the nice graph that I had, will be important if we have so many, so many oral history collections. Um, at the moment, I'm not only working on oral history, but also together with a Dutch academic organization, SURF, for web lectures, and we see the same problem. I mean, if you have 100 web lectures, that's nice, but that was 10 years ago, eight years ago, and now we have more than 1,000 web lectures. That means there are too many web lectures, and students don't know what to, to look at. So what we're trying to do is the same methodology, dividing it, making snippets automatically, and offering the students parts of only talking about lions in South uh, Africa, for example. And then you get five interviews or five snippets from interviews, where some experts are talking about those parts. No, that's good. Questions?